right, let's get going. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the PAD Candidate Forum for the International Tribunal. My name is Andrew Sagan, Executive Director. I am joined by Pierre Priestley, Chicago Alumni Chapter and former Tribune. Brother Priestley will be uh, moderating tonight's forum, which was set up and being administered by the Executive Office. Pierre, did you want to say a few words about yourself, please? Yes, thank you very much, Andrew. I won't say very much. This is all about the candidates tonight. Um, proud to be a 40-year member of Phi Alpha Delta Law Fraternity International and equally proud to have served as a district justice for a period of time and served on this particular board, the International Tribunal, for two years. Um, but other than that, I'm, a proud, I'm just a proud Phi Alpha Delta volunteer and happy to be a part of this process. Thank you all. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, before we get going, I'll explain how tonight's forum will work. Each candidate will have two minutes to present an opening statement. And then in a round robin format, we will move into the questions. Candidates will have two minutes to answer each question. The candidates have also not been given any questions or sample questions in advance. Please utilize the question and answer feature in Zoom to pose questions to the candidates, and then we will ask those questions if we have time. Tonight's forum features our candidates for Chief Tribune and Associate Tribune positions. Uh, these candidates are the Honorable Kimberly Gallant for Chief Tribune, Daniel McDowell for Associate Tribune, who should be joining us shortly, computer update, and Jeff Crane for Associate Tribune. Since the Tribune position is unique and that all positions have the similar job description, position description, and duties, tonight's candidate will answer the same or similar questions unless there are any specific questions posed to them specifically by the audience. I'd also like to do a shout out to the Knoxville alumni chapter who actually started the forums back in 2020. And that was helpful and it made us and inspired us to do this from the executive office as well. We'll post questions as they come in. We'll get through as many questions as we can within the hour. We will stop at nine o'clock. And uh, some questions were submitted in advance. So we will have time after the live questions. We'll move on to those questions. Please know that this session is being recorded. And if you have any questions about the forum, you can please let me know. And that is Andrew at pad.org. So how about we just get started and we'll start with Kim with her opening statement, Kim. All right, well, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I am Judge Kim Gallant and I am honored to be here in this forum. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I am running for the open position of Chief Tribune, Brother Ron Winter has served us in that capacity and has decided to step down and pursue other things. And so I am going to be asking for your vote as Chief Tribune. I have been on uh, the tribunal for the past two bienniums as an associate tribune. Uh, before that, I've served the fraternity uh, starting back in law school as a chapter justice. I've been an assistant DJ, a district justice. I've served on the international executive board. Um, as a member at large, I've done that for two terms. And so I've tried to stay involved with the fraternity uh, since graduating from law school and in my career. Personally, I live in Gwinnett County, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta. I'm married with two kids and we have two dogs who I really hope don't interrupt us tonight. Um, but they are very excited and we do have some storms approaching down here. Um, professionally, uh, I started my career as a prosecutor. I uh, did that for about 10 years, uh, went to work for a Superior Court judge, and then was appointed to the bench myself in 2015. I currently serve as a full-time magistrate court judge. We're the court that's open 24-7 down here, so uh, anything goes bump in the night at 2 a.m. on Christmas morning, it's going to be one of us dealing with it. Uh, but most of my time these days is sitting as a Superior Court judge over felony criminal matters, uh, child custody, divorces, all sorts of civil things, uh, family violence, restraining orders, and things like that. Uh, I am looking forward to uh, answering any questions tonight and looking forward really to seeing everybody again in August. So thank you so much for being here. One side note, I'm worried my computer is going to restart. So I've got a second computer 
uh, ready to back me up. That's why you see me on here twice. So hopefully I don't have to do that. Uh, but just in case, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim, uh, Judge Kim. Uh, we'll pass it on now to uh, Jeffrey Crane. All right, good evening. My name is Jeff Crane. Uh, and like Brother Gallant, uh, I'm happy to have you all here and glad you joined us. Uh, this is my first forum to participate in either as a candidate or as a member. So uh, I think it's a great idea and it's a good thing that we're doing it. Um, so thank you for your time. And I appreciate uh, the comments uh, Kim made about our fraternity. I too uh, started out in law school uh, as a chapter justice and then moved on to being a district justice for several terms uh, and then was elected to the International Executive Board and served one term there. Uh, this is my first uh, session as a Tribune member. I uh, was elected in 2020, and I'm asking for your vote as a re-election uh, as an Associate Tribune for this one. Um, I, like like uh, Brother Gallant said, I've I've had a practice. Uh, we all have at this point, and we're, we're doing great with it. I'm currently the managing partner slash attorney of a very small firm of two attorneys, and uh, I've got two staff members. We handle primarily probate estate planning, adult guardianship, and landlord-tenant law in the Oklahoma City and surrounding areas. I've been doing that for about 18 years, uh, having spent six years on active duty in the Army prior to going to law school. Uh, I'm looking forward to convention, and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Brother Jeff. And then finally, Brother Dan McDowell, you can take yourself off of mute, and uh, please give us your opening statement. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, apologies for being late. I was foiled by technology, which seems to be a theme today. And that's no excuse. It's just uh, what happened. And I apologize for that. Um, my name is Dan McDowell. Uh, currently, I serve as Director of contract, uh, contract Management and Senior Contracts Counsel for a business unit of Emerson that handles industrial control systems. Part of what I do, um, half of my job is, is negotiating. And then, as everybody knows, you're dealing with any large group of people, it's it's uh, it's mediating and arbitrating. But that is actually uh, part of my profession. I'm, I'm a professional arbitrator. I'm on the consumer panel for the AAA. Uh, I have an extensive history and uh, and background in alternative dispute resolution. I've mediated disputes ranging from five hundred dollars into the millions. So when it comes to dispute resolution, um, professionally, it is something that is in my wheelhouse. Um, with respect to the fraternity. Um, I, I've been in the fraternity quite a while. I've held a number of positions, most recently um, international vice justice, which regrettably I had to resign due to job responsibilities that had just taken over, which was a difficult decision for me. But I've served in many positions. I was an international treasurer. I was a district justice. Um, and prior to that, uh, chapter justice at the Watson chapter. Um, this is the, I, I honestly didn't consider running in for the Tribune until it was recommended to me based on my background. And I feel like um, in the event that there is a dispute, I think right now, uh, this is probably a very good place for me to benefit the fraternity. Uh, but of course, I welcome any questions regarding um, my, my background for those of you who do and don't know me. But thank you very much for allowing me to address everyone. And it's great to be here. Thank you very much for all the candidates. We appreciate it. We're going to, I have a few questions that uh, have been submitted previously. Uh, to any of the attendees, if you would like to submit a question to the candidates, we'll have all the candidates answer any question that comes up. Uh, please do so through the Q&A uh, app on your uh, Zoom uh, program, and uh, we'll be happy to get those in and ask those questions. Let me start, uh, and we're going to we'll just stay in the same order uh, that we've used so far. So this will start with uh, with uh, Brother Kim, and then uh, or Sister Kim, and then move on to uh, the other two candidates. The question is: How would you describe your leadership style? Can you share some of your leadership experience? All right, thank you, and it is it is Brother Gallant. Thank you. And right on cue, there go the dogs. I'm so sorry. So my leadership style, um, it's something that I've been working on and evolving over time. Um, I generally am the person that's sort of behind the scenes. I don't generally want to be up front, although that seems where I find myself. 
Um, but I like to be the person behind the scenes making things happen. Um, I work well with others, but I also can have a tendency of let me just handle it and, uh, and get it done. Um, so delegation is something that I need to work on as far as being a leader and being uh, able to effectively communicate uh, what the team needs and what other people can do to get to that goal. Um, but I think as a leader, I'm open to ideas. I listen to folks. I'm consensus builder. Um, I try to stay on top of task. I'm very organized. I've got at least two to-do lists going at any given time. Um, and so I try to stay on top of that. Uh, I'm a graduate of Leadership DeKalb, which is another suburb of Atlanta, and most recently Leadership Gwinnett. And I stay involved just to not only because of the people in the organization, but because I continue to attend seminars and classes on leadership, because I know leadership is something that I'm ever evolving and trying to do better. Um, but I try to lead by example. Um, I do that with my Girl Scout troops. I have two of them. And of course, I do that with my daughters. Um, but I try to lead by example. I try to communicate clearly. And I need to work on the delegation. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, Brother Jeff. Yes, thank you. Uh, leadership was my job for 23 years uh, in the Army as a commissioned officer, uh, both six years on active duty and then another 17 in the reserves. Uh, I was blessed with the rank of lieutenant colonel, ultimately, uh, and led troops uh, in the hundreds uh, at times uh, and in charge of millions of dollars worth of assets and equipment. Um, I saw lots of different leadership styles, and I tried to uh, adopt the ones that I thought were most beneficial and avoid the ones that I thought could be viewed as or, or resulted in toxic behavior. And I think that we are constantly evolving, uh, as Kim said, in our, in our leadership styles. Uh, I've mellowed out a little bit uh, in my middle agedness, and things aren't as type A as they used to be. Uh, by the same token, I have millennials working with me, and uh, I'm having to learn to do things in different ways. And actually, it's been quite enjoyable. Uh, I, I appreciate that challenge. Uh, as a leader of a small law firm, uh, yes, I lead from the front. Uh, yes, I lead by example. But I also have to ensure, and I work very hard at getting buy-in. Because if I'm not developing my subordinates and my coworkers so that they can be successful, that they have the tools and resources they need, uh, then I'm not doing my job right and everything's going to fall apart. So uh, I look forward to, um, to continuing whatever leadership is put in front of me. It's interesting she mentioned leadership, Gwinnett. Uh, I was just selected a couple of weeks ago for Leadership Oklahoma City uh, to start in their signature program this fall, and it'll last about 10 or 11 months. So I'm looking forward to that. That's good to hear. Thank you very much, Brother Jeff and Brother Dan. Uh, yeah. I, I, I hope you'll forgive me. Would you read the question one more time just so I'm sure I'm responsive? I apologize. Oh, be, be happy to. Um, Thank you. How would you describe your leadership style? Can you share some of your leadership experience? Okay, so you're making me follow a judge and a lieutenant colonel. Fantastic. Um, well, I, I, my leadership style, I guess when I took the thing, uh, the, uh, one of those different uh, analysis is, is pretty direct. And um, I think I just have to own that because softening my edges is, uh, it, it's, it's helpful to look at your weak spots, but if you try to change the, the things that you're strongest at, it's, uh, it becomes a little difficult. Uh, in my career, I currently lead two different multinational teams uh, that have uh, I've got personnel in India, in Romania, in uh, Costa Rica, pretty much across the world. Um, and I have to manage teams that are, have the same responsibilities across all those different areas, time zones, and, and, uh, and um, locations. Um, prior to that, in what is something that, and I'll be talking about this tomorrow to a group of new hires, uh, baffles many people, is that the Emerson decided to put myself, who is an attorney and a CPA, in charge of a team of engineers uh, for about two years in order to help shore up some uh, a particular team in a particular area. I'm very proud of the fact that I was able to take a team full of engineers looking at me like, why is this lawyer here? And uh, figure out how to address a number of, of different project shortcomings, but work with the strengths of the team. You know, one thing you learn, and I think if, if, you've, if you've got to pinpoint one thing about my leadership style, is that it's, it's, I don't want to say fluid, but it's, it's adaptive. Because you can't walk into a room full of engineers and pretend you know what's going on. You're not going to fake that till you make it. you got to own up to what you know and what you can do well. 
and figure out how you support those. And that's the most important thing I learned. Is that I think Jeff's right. You've got to lead from the front, but sometimes you really beneath and behind them as a support mechanism as well. And you need to figure out how to support your people in the best way possible. And that's, the, that's my major management approach. Figure out, find the best people, train the best people and support them and let them go. I'd like to follow up on this leadership question. Just, just uh, give me a quick, quick response. Uh, you all three talked about your leadership style generally, and that was the question. So I appreciate your responses. But given that all three of you have served on the International Executive Board of Phi Alpha Delta uh, and have been leaders in Phi Alpha Delta uh, uh, at all different types of levels. How would, you, how would you comment, what would your comment be on your leadership style with regard to Phi Alpha Delta? I understand your professional life, you've covered that, but what about Phi Alpha Delta? Is it different or do you just translate what you just mentioned what, what you just mentioned. So we're going to go in the same order for this uh, and, and then we'll switch it up as far as who goes first on the next question. But just for consistency, uh, Brother Kim, could you elaborate on your Phi Alpha Delta leadership? Sure. So, I mean, starting back in law school, I was part of the, the reactivation effort of our chapter at Georgia State and that's, you know, organizing recruitment uh, being a leader in, in that respect and a chapter justice, making sure we had events and we had a healthy chapter and leading that chapter and continuing to grow that chapter. And I think that's really been my goal throughout my leadership within the fraternity uh, as an ADJ and a district justice is to continue to grow and, and spread the word that uh, we are a fantastic organization and, and these is we're where you need to be. We want you to join us and we want to be a benefit to you. So I think initially it was all about growing the fraternity, growing our uh, members and making sure the word got out. Now, when I went on to the International Executive Board, that was always still in my mind. But as a member of the International Executive Board, the focus shifts a bit. Um, instead of just really looking within Georgia or the Atlanta area and um, growing our chapters, it's more of an overall big picture uh, how can we make the fraternity successful as a whole? And so there in uh, our IEB meetings, um, there's a lot of listening. Um, there are a lot of uh, having to wait your turn to speak and you get a bunch of lawyers in a room. And then there's a lot of uh, talking uh, outside of the meetings, consensus building, working on committees, um, trying to just come up with the best plan. So I think for me, Never, again, wanted to be sort of in the forefront or in the limelight, but always happy to be that consensus builder in the background, trying to solve whatever problems and finding the right people to solve those problems. Another thing that was important to me as far as being a leader in the fraternity when I served on the board is succession planning, trying to look ahead who is going to take our place. I think that's important for a leader to be planning for when you know, the, the best board that you have with you right now is not going to be there. What's going to happen? Sort of the Mack truck theory. Um, and so I think I tried to, to be active in that. We tried to make policy, think through policies of, you know, we have a fantastic executive director, but what if there's one day where Andrew's not here anymore and we have someone that maybe isn't as great? Are our policies in place that's going to protect the fraternity in that manner? Because you have implicit trust in Andrew, but you got to prepare for what if one of us isn't here? Um, and so that succession planning and our next leaders, our policy making and thinking ahead, that's what I really tried to do, sort of be a consensus builder, didn't care if my name's on the committee as the chair or author of whatever, just do the work and uh, do whatever's best for the fraternity. Thank you very much, Brother Kim. Uh, I, think, I think we all took a, a, a deep breath when you said, what if, what if uh, Andrew wasn't here? <laughs> my, heart, my heart skipped a beat. But let's move on. <laughs> Brother Jeff, could you elaborate on your uh, leadership skills with regard to Phi Alpha Delta? Certainly. And Andrew's not allowed to go anywhere ever. So we'll just make that clear now. Um, I would say that, that my leadership style within Phi Alpha Delta has been a lot more teamwork and peer oriented. 
rather than I'm the boss or I'm the leader of the organization with ultimate decision-making authority, either as a commander or as a managing partner or as a chapter justice or something like that. We were, I tried to be more in the realm of we're all peer brothers and sisters in this trying to move forward. And so whether it be a, a chapter project or program, uh, I was maybe providing the vision, but definitely uh, relying upon other committee members, other members of the chapter to actually implement those uh, visions uh, and compliance with fraternity policies and things. As a DJ, sometimes it felt like herding cats. Sometimes it felt like no matter what I told them to do or requested they do, it just wasn't going to happen. And so there was some carrots and sticks at times. Uh, but for the most part, it was a teamwork. How can we make our district better? How can we make our chapters better? How can we provide service to the school and the student and the community and, and the fraternity? And so uh, when I became an executive board member, I found that even more so. Uh, we were leading, but not nearly as much in the direct one-on-one -on -one person sense as we're providing structures and systems for the fraternity. We're providing policies in place so that the the downstream organizational components of the chapters and districts uh, and even alumni chapters and things could, could implement what it is the fraternity was trying to enact as policies. Um, and so not only was it managing the day-to-day -day policy aspect of things, but it was also trying to plan uh, strategic long-term planning, uh, like Brother Kim mentioned, not only contingencies, but where do we see the fraternity in 10 and 20 and 30 years? And how are we doing things now to set us up for success in an environment that we don't even know what that looks like exactly. Uh, and I remember some of the things that we did bringing the internet and, and websites and all the social media into the, the, the forefront of the fraternity aspects. And that was stuff that was very new at the time. Uh, and we didn't know exactly how that was going to work. And boy, has it taken off and we really needed it. Uh, so anyway, those are the thoughts I had. It's, it's a lot more teamwork oriented. Uh, and it's a lot more policy driven and uh, strategic planning driven from what I can, from what I remember. Thank you. Brother, Brother Dan. So I have maybe a little bit of a different turn on this and I didn't put two and two together until I was in a leadership training uh, for my company. And to be honest with you, I'm a little jaded when it comes to those because I've been through a number of them and I wasn't quite sure what to make of this one. And I have to say my initial uh, concerns were unfounded. Um, I got to learn a lot about my leadership style, but the person that I spoke with, so we had to sit down in a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, every individual manager, and you got reviewed. And in that review, it was how did your people view you? across a bunch of scales. And there was a, there was like a form I'd had to take. I think you said it was a W or something that if it was good, it would meet this particular graph form. And I was one of the few that had this. And I, and I know, of course, that's, that's great, but that's one of those things you've got to maintain over time. But the relevance of this discussion was he told, told me about sometimes leaders haven't found certain spaces to expand or use their leadership skills. So they'll go out and they'll find particular ways to do that. Phi Alpha Delta was that for me. So essentially my leadership skills grew up through Phi Alpha Delta rather than me bringing them back to it. And a lot of what everybody talked about and having to deal with the different levels of, all right, you're at the board now, or you're at district justice now, or you're uh, at chapter justice now. I learned a lot about motivating people that just, I mean, you didn't have a stick for lack of a better term. There was no uh, there was no negative motivation. You only had positive motivation. You could only get people to follow you if you convinced them. You couldn't force them. And I just learned a lot about that and how to evolve a strategy around that. And as you go along, you realize that, yeah, in, in reality, no matter what your title is, you're going to have to convince people that what you're asking them to do is the right thing if you want complete buy-in and, and as much success as you can have. I don't like the word total or complete success because everything's got an improvement, but you know, I, I just learned that through Phi Alpha Delta. And when I got to the board, you know, again, it wasn't, I'll, I'll be frank, in the room, it wasn't as much leadership as it was mediation, alternative dispute resolution skills, because we needed to talk to each other in a way that was effective, because when we didn't, nothing got done. 
So when you leave the room, though, it is very different. You have to remember that what you say as a board member is viewed very differently than it was as a district justice, or even especially as a chapter justice. So the adjustment for me, which is uh, something that I, I think Jeff and Kim experience on a professional level consistently, consistently due to what they do in, in, you know, in the military as a judge in the public eye, me in my corporation now as a director, I'm realizing that people are watching this. And I learned these things from Phi Alpha Delta. I picked up on these things. And so I, I kind of carried my leadership from Phi Alpha Delta to my job. So the answer is, I, I guess my style is, has evolved based on that experience, but it, I don't use a different mechanism, method, manner, approach um, between the two organizations. But as others have said, I think Jeff was talking about, and I think Kim to a certain extent, at different levels, you're going to have different Man, you know mechanisms, but my approach overall hasn't really isn't really different. Beautiful, thank you very much. Um, we are going to switch up the order so that one person isn't always the first, one isn't always the last. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask another question. I will ask uh, Jeff Crane, uh, brother Jeff, to address it first. Then we will move to Dan second, and Kim Gallant, third. Here's a question, folks. Being that all three of you have served on the International Executive Board, in your opinion, how is serving on the TRIB different than serving on the board? And do you think that the three that there are challenges you may face uh, about numbers influencing your opinion? So it's sort of a compound question, but basically, uh, you know, how is it, how do you find, how do you believe serving on the Tribune is different? And the question also is perhaps because of that knowledge, uh, do you, how do you uh, think you will face the challenges of members influencing your opinion? So thank you. Brother Jeff, could you start? Yes, sir, thank you. Um, some of the obvious differences are the roles uh, in, the, in the fraternity documents set out different functions uh, for the, the International Executive Board and the International Tribune. The board is the policymakers. They are the acting, moving, fluid, working board throughout the biennium uh, who sets and directs policy for the fraternity. The Tribune, however, does not do that. They are uh, there as an adjudicative body, in my opinion, according to the documents, to um, rule on cases and controversies. Now, from time to time, there are other functions that the the board may ask the Tribune to do, and, and we've done several of those over the past uh, year or so. Uh, what does that mean so far as the, the differences in, in how I approach those? Um, you know, I think that as an international executive board member, we, we were, I was, and we needed to be receptive to all sorts of ideas, whether they come from a chapter member or an alumni member or a fellow leadership position within the fraternity. Uh, we were there to, to help take the pulse of the fraternity and incorporate that into our policies where appropriate and to, uh, like has been mentioned before, gain consensus. And sometimes um, that meant kind of taking informal polls and speaking with members within district justices or others to kind of get a sense of what's going on in the fraternity and how can we best implement uh, policies and procedures that work for and, and support the members of the fraternity. The Tribune has a very different role from that. Um, yes, I'm not saying that we cloister ourselves off in a hole. We still are fraternal with one another, but that's not our job to implement policy. Uh, and so uh, I, I've worked diligently to maintain as much uh, neutrality as possible uh, so that if something were to come along, uh, we can we can rule fairly. Uh, we can take an objective approach to it. Um, so I just I think they have very different roles by design. And therefore, um, that's the way I approach it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Jeff. Uh, Brother Dan. So kind of setting aside what uh, Jeff was talking about along the defining of the roles being different on paper. Um, again, I don't know that my answer will be a whole lot different, but let me explain how I think about it. The one thing before I proceed, though, Pierre, I... There was a second part of your question about influencing. Could you read that again? Because I'm not sure I quite understood. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, Thank you. 
Do you think that there are challenges you may you may face about members influencing your opinion? Okay. Um, so this position has you know both the ben- has a benefit and a detriment. I mean, it's an attribute that can be both ways. Um, we're not the ones that have to be out there like the board making the policy and and taking the criticisms. Uh, all of us have been out there and seen that, and, and it's 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 remarkable. It's even when you're so convinced you're right. To your point, there are people with differing viewpoints, and you have to be open to them. Uh, one of the things. Um, I think I can't remember who the hedge fund manager was, but he said strong convictions loosely held. So you need to be willing to test those based on opinions of others that you respect. So you should have strong convictions, but you shouldn't be, you shouldn't fall them into the ground, essentially is the way I look. With respect to how I would approach this job, what I'm talking about is having the benefit and the detriment is, as I said, you're not out, you're not making policies. You can't really drive from this position, but you do have a responsibility um, to uphold and remain, how to phrase this. You don't have to make those policy decisions so you don't suffer the criticism. However, because of that, you must be above reproach when it comes to decision-making. That's the hard part of everybody's biased in some way. If you say that you're not, you're lying. That's the nature of human beings. We have different biases and such. I think you have to maintain that integrity and be free from that bias when you uphold the important principles of the fraternity. There are going to be a lot of people that still disagree with that. Um, I think that it's, I don't know, I don't know that it's less or more onerous to deal with them being on the trip, but in the end, you have to make the right decision for the right reasons. And you're going to have to explain it. And I, I just, I do, I view them as very different. I view this as an ADR committee that must be impartial, must be neutral and must make decisions based on the best interests of the fraternity subject to the rules in the particular matter. Um, so I, I, I don't see being influenced too much by the outside because you're not really supposed to have that influence. So I, I kind of say, I don't know that I would be to the second part of the question. So I, 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 I know it's a little rambling, but I, I'm, I'm just not sure how to answer that second part of the question. I don't think I would be affected by opinions because I don't think you're supposed to be in this role. That's my answer. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you very much. And Brother Kim. So, I mean, I've, I've had the benefit of four terms on the IEB and now two terms as uh, a member of the trip. And it, it is very different. I remember Kitty Maloney pulling me aside at one convention and she was on the trip at the time. And she said, it very much feels like you're on an island when you're on the trip. And to a certain extent, that's true because you have to maintain that neutrality. You can't be in the fray anymore. You can't be sort of in the weeds. And as a member of the IEB, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, we were traveling all over the country, going to district conferences, mock trials here, pre-law conferences there. You very much felt like what was going on in the fraternity you were a part of and knew about. As a member of the TRIB, and thanks to the pandemic, uh, it's been a little bit easier to remove myself so there is, can't be any sort of issue about a bias if something comes up. I purposefully have pulled myself off of some of the social media where there was a lot of talk, especially leading up to this 2020 um, convention, which we actually got a a case and controversy this time. Um, And so I think as a member of the TRIB, you have to sort of give up a little bit of sort of not the social, but the the in the weeds, um, really in the thick of everything that's going on, talking with people about uh, what's going on, because you have to be able to reserve in case a case or controversy does. I mean, it's what I have to do at work. Um, you just have to maintain that balance. And the easy part about the fraternity is we're all lawyers and law students. And so it's um, 
second nature us to un- to understand we're not supposed to talk to the judges. We're not supposed to talk. So I think we all know that and have always respected our members of the TRIB. You know, it certainly can get, it's been easier pandemic wise because there hasn't been all of those late nights, you know, talking about what happened on the floor and, you know, nominations going on during convention and who's supporting who and all of that. So the pandemic has helped with that. But I do think as a member of the TRIB, you have to pull back a bit because you never know what issue is going to be a case or controversy. And I would hate to have myself as one of three have to recuse and then create all of that because I was in the middle of it because I was curious or, you know, whatever. Um, as far as member influence, again, I think it's it's helpful that we're a law fraternity and I think people know they're not supposed to talk to us. And so it, it's a little bit easier to say, hmm, I can't really talk about that. But I will say I, I've try to maintain the uh, independence of the trip by removing myself from certain things and not really getting into the thick of it, trying to stay above whatever conversations and debates. Um, and that's something you have to give up to be on the trip because you're, you know, you still are a member, you still have opinions and certainly there's a, a proper way to express them. You don't give them up as a member of the trip, but you certainly have to accept that you can't be as public and as vocal and you might have to step out. Oh, was that my time limit? So that's that. That's how I'd answer that question, Pierre. Thank you very much, and I apologize for the for the phone uh, for the phone going off. I thought I had shut off my my phones. Um, I want to follow up. Uh, and this this next this next question is is a follow up to the one I just asked, um, but actually something you said, uh, Kim. I think I think maybe capsulizes uh, the point even better using the term. So here's the question, and I'll expand upon it. A primary role of the TRIB is to rule on rule on cases and controversy. What would be your approach to handling the conflict and issuing opinions impartially? But I will add to that, as Kim mentioned, being on the Tribune. You, you do have to stay above the fray in some form or fashion. So in, in keeping that in mind that during convention, at least you have to sort of recuse yourself from the day-to-day banter that might be going on uh, during the convention and after the convention. So again, speaking of this whole issue of impartiality, I do understand that you actually, all three of you have sort of touched upon this. So I'll just ask you to maybe uh, embellish or or uh, or just add to it a little bit more specifically with, with regard to the, the formulation of the opinion, what is your approach and 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 in and in doing that, uh, how do you how do you uh, uh, maintain that that distance that is necessary as a member of the International Tribune. And we'll start, we'll start with Dan McDowell this time. Well, first is this strong, overarching, abiding need to get completely away from any controversy I've been involved in with the fraternity after the last few years. So um, I have a deep self-preservation desire to be able to step back from the fray. Um, but all kidding aside, I mean, I, again, a, a, having served as a professional neutral for a number of years, um, it's, it's just, you have to know where the line is. And sometimes you have to draw that line 10 feet in front of where you think the line is because you're just not sure. And so it really does rely on judgment because it, it's, it's very hard. If there weren't issues with this, you wouldn't have ethics boards all over the country with issues to deal with because everyone would know where the line is. Um, it does come down to the person. And it comes down to their experience with dealing with conflict. And I have a, a role professionally where I'm, I'm an attorney to the organization, but part of my team is not attorneys. And I sometimes I'll deal with things that are privileged, sometimes not. So I have to draw the line on a daily basis as to what I do discuss and what I don't discuss. And so it's, I think anybody could do it better. I don't want to say I'm the, you know, I'm, I'm the expert at this, but I have a lot of repetitions in it and seem to have based on objective review done it well enough uh, to, to 
be significantly respected in, in my particular professional you know choice at my company. So I I just feel like that is it, the impartiality is is second nature. There are going to be times where you just you know you have to you want to give an opinion. You really you know, you're talking about somebody you know. I mean, we all know people on the board. So, but it is one of those times where you just have to understand and hold that professional responsibility far above your personal desires, which is something that frankly is difficult, I think, these days and maybe maybe more acceptable and, and less I, I just I came up I, I came up with the idea that that was what you respected and you preserved because it was important despite your feelings. And so it's just it's just something that that we do. I think we do professionally and, and we should all be good at, especially if you function in a neutral or a leadership position that requires you to draw that line. Fair enough. Uh, Brother Kim? So one of the, the cool things um, I think about the three of us running um, at this time for the trip is all three of us have had experience sort of progressing through the fraternity and sort of practicing in real life, stepping back from different people and groups. All three of us were DJs. DJs are close. Um, you talk a lot. There is a lot of camaraderie, a lot of frank talk among DJs. But once we were all elected to the International Executive Board, you have to take a step back from the DJs. Prime example, you all know my best friend, Melody Crick Peters. When I went on to the IEB, she and I had an understanding that there were just certain things that we couldn't talk about. She would share with me her opinions. I would receive them as an IEB member. I would take them back and share them. But there were conversations I didn't have with her. And so it kind of continues having stepped from the IEB onto the trip. Same thing. It's just another progression, a step removed from like I said, the 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 uh, weeds or what's going on with the policy and, and in the heart of the fraternity, the life of the fraternity. And so I think all three of us have had the experience of doing that incrementally in our leadership paths with the fraternity. Incidentally, I also think that's what makes um, us qualified for the trip, because at one point, it seems like when I first came on, the trip were people who had not been on the board. Maybe they came through another leadership path. And I think sort of now it, it's changed where many folks who have been on the trip in recent times have been on the International Executive Board. And I think that's a positive because we come onto the trip with a working knowledge really of all aspects of the fraternity. Um, but we've had the ability to sort of step back as we've progressed and we can e exercise that once we get onto the trip. You still, we have the base, the foundation of the workings of the fraternity. But um, as far as approaching cases, we know as a member of the TRIB that there's got to be that wall. And the best example I can give is my relationship with Melody. You know, she is still my best friend. We talk all the time and text, um, but it just has sort of changed from our conversations when we were DJs together. It's not the same conversations we have today. And I think that's just part of the gig. And if you want to have this position and you feel like you're the right person, that's just part of what you have to agree to give up. And so that's how I approach it, that this is just another step along the progression and it comes with responsibilities and obligations and it's what you got to do. Thank you very much, Brother Kim. And finally, Brother Jeff. I, I think that the, the question was to some degree, how do we approach uh, handling a particular case uh, that came before the TRIB, um, obviously there's there's structural rules in place for how we would go about doing that. Uh, and we would look at, uh, you know, what are the allegations? What is the complaint? Uh, what rule applies, of course, and then do our best as lawyers and as fraternal members to come up with the best resolution possible for the fraternity and the parties involved. Um, I think that's what makes us a little more unique uh, in that you know, a regular district judge or, or magistrate or, or, or even appellate body doesn't have that requirement and that undergirding of fraternalism that we have. And so while, yes, there may be a quote winner and a quote loser in any particular case or controversy, I think one thing that makes the trip unique and I think that we are all three of these candidates well qualified for is 
trying to find that balance of what is the best result for the fraternity as a whole? And what is the best result that we can achieve? Um, Cause we're not here to impose, you know, massive criminal sanctions upon anybody. That's just not our role. So it, like, like Dan has said, we're there to be arbitrators, but also mediators to some degree. Um, we're all going to be brothers and sisters in the fraternity before it and after it. So we need to maintain that level of fraternalism, but also the fraternity is called upon us to make an adjudication. And that's our role. And we will do that in an orderly fashion, whatever that may be, um, and, and arrive at a result that is an opinion from the tribune, not from any particular one person or two people. Um, and I think that's a, a great aspect of the way the tribune works is that it is a deliberative body rather than three individual members. Uh, who render opinions. Um, hopefully, I don't have to do that. Uh, but if I do, I know that I'm, I'm capable of doing that and working with others. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Jeff. Thanks to all three of you. We have about 12 minutes, give or take, uh, before the end of this session. So I would again like to urge any of our attendees, if you have a question, uh, now is the time to please uh, put it in the Q&A section of the uh, Zoom, Zoom uh, screen uh, so that we can get it in. Uh, if, uh, if it's okay with uh, Andrew, I will allow a minute uh, per uh, candidate at the end of the session, we'll, we'll save about three or four minutes so that each candidate has a one minute wrap up because I'm sure there will be things you wanted to say that I didn't give you an opportunity to say. And I want you to be able to make your best case for your particular position. So absent any problems or objection from Andrew, we'll, we'll save a couple of three or four minutes uh, at the end of the session, but we do have a hard close on the hour. Uh, the next question, we'll have uh, Kim to start off again. And uh, that is, what are some of the opportunities for the TRIB that you see the TRIB being able to develop for the future? A great question. Um, because we still are members of the fraternity, we still want to very much be involved in the life of the fraternity. And so the best example is, you know, being at mock trial, being at the pre-law mock trial, um, standing in at district conferences, still getting to go and, and meet the folks and uh, be goodwill ambassadors, for lack of a better phrase, for the fraternity. I think there's tremendous opportunity for us to do that. Um, it's a sticky situation because you can't get, like I said earlier, really involved in policymaking or debates. Um, but I think there's a great opportunity for us to be sort of goodwill ambassadors, to be mentors, um, to be judges for mock trials, to let the um, students know if, if they've got something going on and, and they need a speaker. You know, we, we're part of that bank of speakers and alumni that still want to be involved, still want to be, you know, invited and attend events as we can. Um, I just I think we have a lot of opportunity there. I think we have to just be very careful and mindful of how we do that. Um, in order to maintain the integrity of the body. Fair enough. Thank you very much, Brother Kim. Uh, moving on to uh, Brother Dan. Um, when I think about this, I think about it in two different ways. First, it'd be similar to the ways Kim discussed is, you know, for lack of a better term, off the top of my head, kind of an ambassador for the fraternity. Um, that's not on the IEB, but is still a, a member and, and representative of, of, of the upper leadership uh, and to assist in, in, you know, where necessary and appropriate. I do, I hesitate to give this example because part of me is hoping we never get to this point, but uh, I often wonder if there are other, and again, you're just going to see a theme uh, and I'm probably, you know, bang this drum on on alternative dispute resolution and, and different ways to reconcile disputes. I just don't know enough right now to say uh, negatively or affirmatively as to whether there are other opportunities to better handle disputes inside the organization when they arise. And if there are other disputes that aren't rising to the level of the tribune as they're current as it's currently reflected in the governing documents, 
that we might be able to maybe not address directly, but come up with procedures to address. I, I don't know because I'm outside of it right now. I'm not really sure. Um, but I don't want to foreclose that opportunity to do dispute resolution inside the organization better. So I, I kind of see that as more of an exploratory approach. And I know Andrew's getting nervous. He's like, oh, damn, what are you doing? Um, but I, I, I really just, I, I don't know what I don't know. And, and it may be something that's worth looking into. The main thing for me, though, and again, I, admittedly, maybe problematically, but it is who I am. I'm, I'm kind of old school about this. And I feel like in a lot of cases, if there's a dispute, everybody's getting riled up and you've got a bunch of students getting riled up and they come to you and you explain to them your role and you say, look, I can't get into that in the event there is a dispute and you do it respectfully. That may be the first professional encounter they have in which someone has said, as an attorney would, I can't talk to you about that. And I think that's an important thing for, for law students and, 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 you know, to an extent, new lawyers who aren't litigators to run into. It's that professionalism of dispute resolution and professionalism of litigation that I, I feel like is, I've been banging on this drum for years, feel like it's getting lost. So. All right. Thank you very much. Brother Jeff. Well, thank you. Um, what other roles could the, could the TRIB and what other functions could they accomplish? I think that's uh, one of the one of the hot topic questions that's been going on in the fraternity for several years is what is the role of the TRIB and what should it be if it's not what it is already? And um, I know there's been some some discussion of that for at least at least two biennium now. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details in that, of course, but I think that we're kind of on the edge of a who are we and what do we want to be when we grow up sort of phase as in a fraternity in so far as things that were created 100 years ago with the fraternity may still be viable and productive and necessary going forward into the next 50 to 100 years. I think that's a great thing about the fraternity is that we respect our traditions and carry them forward where appropriate. But I also recognize that the way we did things 100 years ago may not be always, in every case, the best way to do it for the next 100 years. And so I think the fraternity is, is finding itself at, at, at a, a crossroads of sorts uh, in what to do with the TRIB. Um, I think that, that the way it's structured now is a very good structure. Uh, I would agree with Dan that there may be alternative dispute resolution avenues we could approach, but I think we need to do that in a very deliberative and, and planned out manner uh, that, is, that is going to be well implemented and not be a knee-jerk reaction to anything. Um, and, I, and I hope that we don't do that as a fraternity. Uh, and I hope that we move forward in a way that's going to benefit uh, and provide not only due process, but actual resolution of our disagreements. Because um, like I said at the beginning, it, we are still brothers and sisters in the fraternity and there is still uh, a fraternalism and we want to accomplish that wherever possible. Thanks. Beautiful, thank you very much, Jeff. Well, we've, we've reached, we're very close to the end. So I'm going to give uh, all three of you an opportunity for a, let's keep it between one minute and one minute, 15 seconds. I think that'd be fair uh, opportunity to make a closing statement. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll wrap up and say good night to all of the attendees and candidates. Uh, let's start with uh, Jeff. All right, thank you. Um... Just in closing, uh, like I just said in my opening statement, uh, I've been in a variety of roles within the fraternity. We've talked about that. Uh, I'm currently on the TRIB and, and I'm running again for associate position. Would ask for your vote in that regard. Um, our, our letter of intent has been published online. I would welcome you to review those uh, for all of us. Uh, if you have any input uh, to that, you know there are other fraternity members you can speak with. Uh, I would encourage you to, to talk to one another and, and debate as appropriate. Um, I would, I would like to serve on the trip because I think it's a great position for me at this point in my life and in my career, uh, both within the fraternity as well as professionally, uh, like Dan and Kim both have had a uh, fantastic experience for the last 20 years or so with the fraternity. Uh, I too feel that this is a good spot for me to be in, uh, that I can be impartial where need be, uh, but also remain fraternal, uh, and do what's best fraternity when called upon, uh, as well as continue to be an ambassador and a mentor. Uh, to other junior attorneys and, and peers alike. 
Um, and I ask for you to consider that and thank you. And we'll see you at convention. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to uh, Judge Gallant, Brother Gallant, Brother. Yes, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address everyone. I am uh, seeking uh, the nomination from the committee and your vote for Chief Trib. I think uh, the only difference is that just means I'll be the organizer. Um, as a Chief Trib, I'm still a member of the Trib as far as rendering any decisions. It's just the Chief part uh, does the organizing and gets all the service. Um, as Jeff said, I mean, I think it's a good part of uh, my professional development to be on the TRIB. It's what I've been doing sort of as a judge, maintaining neutrality for the last seven years. Um, and I think it's a good place um, in my, the progression of my leadership with the fraternity, starting from a chapter justice, serving on the board, and now here. Um, I believe the TRIB has a place in our fraternity. Um, and I want to continue to serve the fraternity. That's what I've always wanted to do. I think our fraternity is magical. It is fantastic. We are different than other legal organizations I'm a member of, um, and it's because of those fraternal bonds that, that Jeff touched upon, and that's why I stay involved and want to continue to serve. Um, you, as Jeff said, you got our letters of intent. Our resumes have been posted, so you can see what my involvement with the fraternity has been what my involvement is uh, professionally and with outside organizations. Um, I do try to lead by example. I do try to build consensus um, and I wouldn't change any of that uh, as your next chief trip. And I hope you'll give me that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, brother Dan. Thank you. Um, as others, just to state the obvious, I am seeking the nomination and, and your vote for this position. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here and to speak in this forum. Um, as also has been said, the candidacy statements and, and bio slash resume are available online. So I don't really wanna bore anybody with that. Uh, I just hope that as you review those and you listen to my answers, that you find that my particular background and skill set would be appropriate for the position. Uh, I wanna to continue to serve the organization. I, I wish I had the capacity to serve it as I had in the past, but sometimes you have to accept that, that you've made certain decisions in your life and they've led you to certain places. And I, this isn't, you know, this is not a, this is not something that, that one might look at as, oh, well, that's a nice, that's a nice place to be. No, I, I want to be here. I'm not, I'm not doing this for, you know, I just want to stay involved. I legitimately believe that my background and my skill sets are actually uniquely suited to be here in this position. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be doing it. I think maybe I, I got to give fate a little credit for that. Uh, maybe that's what the whole thing was, was bringing me to. So I appreciate everybody listening. I hope my answers are satisfactory and I look forward to seeing everybody. Thank you. Thank you to all of the candidates. I will turn it over to, to, uh, to Brother Sagan to, to close it out. But again, thank you to the candidates for being here and uh, we truly appreciate your service uh, to Phi Alpha Delta Law Fraternity. Brother Andrew. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Kim, Dan, and Jeff uh, for, uh, for running for the trip. And thank you, Pierre, for moderating tonight. We're going to, uh, again, post this video on our YouTube channel and we'll have this available for view if you'd like to review it or if you'd like to share it with folks. And uh, with that said, we are done for tonight and we will see you all at convention. Have a lovely evening.